afternoon. You could take your seats and enjoy your brown bag lunch while you're here. We're going to get started. We've got a terrific crowd here. I'm Susan Richardson Williams, and I'm the current president of the East Tennessee Historical Society. We're very, very happy to have you here today. Uh, before I introduce Justice Lee, I'd like to acknowledge some of our other judges that we have in the room. Tennessee um, Court of Appeals Judge Charles Susano, are you here? There you are. Hello, Judge. Uh, Circuit Court Judge John Duggar. Thank you. Um, Tennessee Attorney General Bob Cooper, are you here? Welcome. <laughs> and Assistant Commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Veterans Affairs, Retired Chief Petty Officer Don Smith, Spring City. <laughs> We're very honored to have all of you here, and uh, I have done a little preview of this presentation today. Get your Kleenex out. Uh, it's good. It's very, it really is an honor for me today and a real pleasure to introduce Justice Sharon Lee. I've known her for a while. Our daughters were in school together, and uh, so I've taken a few trips with her and also uh, served with her as a member of the Executive Women's Association. And that's, in fact, where I saw her presentation. And it's, it's really a wonderful wonderful piece and I'm, I know you're going to be delighted to hear her today. Sharon is a very proud native of Monroe County, Tennessee. She's down the road from us. She graduated from the University of Tennessee College of Law and the College of Business. She's practiced law in her hometown of Madisonville from 1978 until 2004. In 2004 she was appointed to serve as a judge in the Tennessee Court of Appeals and then was subsequently elected to that position in 04 and, and re-elected again in 2006. 2008, she was appointed to the Tennessee Supreme Court and was elected to that in 2010. She serves on the board of the East Tennessee Historical Society, another reason we're proud to have her here today, the Knoxville YWCA and Sequoia's Birthplace Museum in Bonneville. She served on the board of directors for Boys and Girls Club in Monroe County, President of the East Tennessee Lawyers for Women and is the District Director for the National Association of Women Judges. We are very proud to have her as a member of our board, the East Tennessee Historical Society, but even more proud to have her on our Supreme Court in Tennessee. Please help me welcome Justice Sharon Lee. for that nice introduction and I want to thank all of you for being here today. You're in for a treat. I think we have a, a really good group of stories I want to share with you. Uh, these are the stories of five American heroes with common bonds. These American soldiers fought in World War II and they were captured and held in German prison camps. They came from different places. They had different backgrounds, different religions, and different prison experiences. Despite these differences, they shared some common traits and qualities that helped them endure and survive their prison experience. And they all had children who were judges and lawyers in Tennessee. The first soldier is James Hugh Ross. Just two weeks after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Hugh, who lived down in Etowah, Tennessee, joined the Army Air Corps. He was assigned to fly as a radio operator on the B-17 bomber which was nicknamed the Flying Fortress. In November of 1942, Hugh and his crew were, were sent from their base, <coughs> were sent to their base in Algiers, Africa. Mm -hmm. On January 3rd, 1943, the crew was sent out on their first and their last bombing raid. Their assignment was to bomb a Nazi base on the Mediterranean Sea in North Africa. After the B-17 dropped its bomb, one of its engines was hit with flak from German ground fire, and the plane started going down. The plane crash landed so hard in the Sahara Desert that a bone in his neck was fractured. When the crew got out of the plane, the Germans from a nearby anti-aircraft bunker surrounded the crew, brandishing their guns and yelling at the soldiers. 
You and his crew were captured and became prisoners of war on January 3, 1943. Hugh's family learned of his capture on January 29, 1943, when Western Union delivered a telegram to his mother in Inglewood. After their capture, the crew was flown to Naples, Italy, and then taken by train to Rome. They spent the night down in one of the catacombs, which dated back from the early Roman times. That's a lot for a young man from, from Edelwall. They then traveled by train to Frankfurt, and in Frankfurt he was placed in a solitary confinement in a small, dark cell for two weeks. On the last day of his confinement, he was taken out and interrogated. And as trained, he only gave his name, rank, and serial number. He was sent to a prison camp called Stalag 7A in Duisburg, Germany, which is about 30 miles northeast of Munich. The barracks consisted of long rows of bunks, three decks high, with two beds placed end to end in each row. Two men were placed in each bunk. There was no heat and very little food. After several weeks, they were moved to Stall Lake 7B, which is about 50 miles north of Berlin. To get there, he and the other prisoners were placed in a cattle car containing 76 men. They were confined in that single box car for three days and not allowed out at any time. There was no room to lie down. There was no food or water during those three days. And many of the men were very sick with dysentery. The only restroom facility was a steel drum placed in the middle of the car. This ride in the cattle car was one of the worst experiences of his time in prison camp. At this point, the outcome of the war was very much in doubt. The men were demoralized, and they did not know what their fate would be at the next prison camp. Most had lost a lot of weight, and they were sick and they were hungry. Many had suffered injuries before their capture, and there had been no medical treatment. After this long journey, the men arrived at Star Lake 7B, where they stayed for a couple of months. At this camp, they did not receive Red Cross packages, and they had very little to eat. The main fare was soup consisting of only two ingredients, water and the heads of fish, eyeballs, brains, everything all boiled together. In December of 1943, Hugh and his crew were transferred to Stahl Lake 17B in Austria. This camp was the largest POW camp in Austria and one of the largest, uh, I think it was the second largest in Europe. And it contained as many as 40,000 men from 10 countries. Hugh and 4,000 other Americans stayed there uh, for about 14 months. There was no heat during those cold German winter months. They slept in wooden bunks on pallets made of wood shavings stuffed in burlap bags. They received some Red Cross packages which contained food rations that kept them alive. Very few Americans starved to death at this camp because of the Red Cross packages. The Russians, however, were not so fortunate. They did not get or have Red Cross packages. And one morning, he remembered seeing 28 Russians, soldiers who had starved to death, carried out in the morning. In April of 1945, as the Russians approached, the Germans began to evacuate the camp. The Americans were marched along the Danube River across Austria in a forced march. They were fed only five times by the Germans and had to scavenge the countryside for what little food they could get. It was on this march that Hughes saw a long procession of Jewish prisoners marching west. And as bad as he looked and felt, he knew these Jewish prisoners were in much worse shape. One night when they were camped, they saw and heard American fighter planes overhead. The OW stood and they waved their arms to get the attention of the pilots. The planes returned and then after making several passes over the group, roared over them, widening their wings to signal they, they knew who they were uh, and that help was on the way. The German guards began at this point acting very friendly to the prisoners. <laughs> And it took several more weeks, however, of marching before they were liberated. After being a prisoner of war for over two years, Hugh was liberated and taken to Camp Lucky Strike in France, and then he returned home. He returned to Etowah, where he married and helped raise four children, one of whom, Judge Carol Ross, is a judge in the 10th Judicial District. 
If you worked for the railroad and in 1948 was elected tax assessor for Mackinac County. He served as tax assessor until President Eisenhower appointed him to serve as postmaster of the Inglewood Post Office where he worked until his retirement. He eventually lost his eyesight due to malnutrition uh, from his prison experience. Only a few days after Hugh Ross was captured, my dad, Charles Lee, a 19-year-old farm boy from Teleco Plains down in Monroe County, joined the Army Air Corps in January of 1943. The oldest of eight children, his family lived in Teleco Plains at the edge of the Cherokee National Forest. He was trained to be a waste gunner and a flight engineer on a B-17 bomber. He rode a train to New York City after undergoing quite a bit of training. And then he headed out with 10,000 other men on a ship headed toward London, England. He was based in southern England and would fly there on bombing missions over Germany. My dad and the rest of his crew began flying missions on the B-17 bomber, which they nicknamed the Smoky Stover Jr. The bombing missions were dangerous, and although the average number of flights flown before getting shot down was five, you had to fly 25 missions to get to come home. On May 12, 1944, the Army Air Corps launched one of the biggest air campaigns of the war. It was in preparation for D-Day, and the purpose was to bomb the Germans' fuel production facilities. There were 935 B-17s flying in the air from London on this date. And of the 26 planes that took off in my dad's squadron, only 12 were able to return. This would be his sixth bombing mission and would be his last. As he manned the right waist gun, Standing in front of a waist-high opening in the plane in sub-zero weather, he saw a vapor trail at 2 o'clock, which was an indication of enemy aircraft. Soon, he saw it at the 1 o'clock position. And then he didn't see the vapor trail, it disappeared, which indicated that the plane had banked and was coming directly at them. The B-17's companion fighter planes had been lured into a dogfight, so it had no protection. He alerted the pilot, and then as the German planes attacked, the smoky stover was hit and started going down. During this attack, my dad had been shot and suffered wounds to his head, shoulder, back, and wrist. The pilot rang the bell for everybody to uh, bail out, um, but he had been knocked to the ground and was unable to get up. And a fellow airman helped him up, and was able to get him out of the plane. As he was parachuting down, he saw a German fighter plane bank, turn, and come toward him as he spiraled to the ground. The plane came close enough for him to see the white scarf around the German pilot's neck. They made eye contact, and then the German pilot raised his hand in a respectful salute, and then flew off with the rest of the German aircraft. He hit the ground hard, uh, injured his ankle, and was later captured, tried to hide for a while, uh, but then was captured by members of the German Home Guard. He was loaded onto a truck which contained other airmen and was taken to a jail in a small town outside of Frankfurt, Germany. He was held in solitary confinement uh, for 10 days and uh, never received any medical treatment. Uh, and then as trained, when he was interrogated, only gave his name rank and civil number. After 10 days, uh, then he was released, and the rest of the crew were put on a train, and they were taken to a newly opened prison camp in Poland called Stalag Left 4. His family was notified of his capture in late May of 1944. Nearly 10,000 prisoners would eventually be held at Stalag Left 4. Although the camp was new, the conditions were very bad. Prisoners were punished if they did not obey the rules. One day a prisoner jumped out of a window instead of going out the door for roll call, and he was shot and killed for this infraction. Food was mostly a soupy mixture of rotten cabbage and water, and bread made mostly out of sawdust. Red Cross packages were often not delivered. The barracks were made for 16, but usually contained 22 or 25 men. Most left on the bare floor or on wood shavings. <coughs> It was very little heat. My dad was never given anything to wear other than the bloodstained clothes he had on when he was captured. Due to his untreated illnesses or untreated injuries, he had a subsequent battle with hepatitis. He became very sick 
and only survived due to the persistence of his fellow prisoners who would make him get up and walk each day. The worst part of, of his incarceration, like King Ross, was a ride in a cattle car. When the Russians were advancing toward this part of Poland, overtaking the Germans, the Germans were forced to move all 10,000 men, uh, all 10,000 prisoners, to another camp. And those who were too sick or too injured to march, uh, the entire distance were marched through knee-deep snow, and they, were, they boarded a train. There were about 60 POWs in every boxcar. It was cold. They had no coats. There was no food or water except for some water and cabbage soup and that bread made from sawdust. It was so cramped in a small boxcar that for anyone to sit down, others had to stand, and they had to sleep standing up. Most suffered from dysentery and other illnesses, and they were not allowed out during the entire 10-day trip. They traveled to Stalag Luft One, which was a camp in Barth, Germany, on the Baltic coast. Meanwhile, back in Teleco Plains, representatives of the Army Air Corps came to Teleco Plains and presented his mother, the family, with an air medal at a somber ceremony at the family home. And at this time, three of the four sons were away serving in the military. I think that's why my grandmother looks so, so sad and so serious in those photographs. In late April of 1945, my dad started hearing the big guns of the Russian army. And on April 30th, 1945, the German guards returned his personal possessions in a simple manila envelope in the very same condition they had been in when he was captured over a year earlier. That night, then the Germans fled the camp. And when they woke up the next morning, all the guards were gone. His liberation occurred, his final liberation occurred on May 13, 1945, one year and one day from his capture. The prisoners were flown out on B-17 bombers to Camp Lucky Strike in the heart of France. At this time, he stood 6 feet 3 inches tall, and he only weighed 86 pounds. He was hospitalized in Florida for a period of time, and then he returned home to Telco Plains. He started a business, got married, started raising a family, and he served for 12 years as a county commissioner for Monroe County. He was a national officer in the American Ex-Prisoners of War Organization. And he died on February 27, 2009, at the age of 96. The next hero I want to tell you about is Lieutenant Harold Leibowitz, who is the father of Judge Mary Beth Leibowitz here in Moss County. Harold was from Brooklyn, New York, and he volunteered for the Army Air Corps. In May of 1944, he and his crew were based in England, and they began flying bombing runs over Germany. He flew many successful bombing missions and was just one mission away from coming home when his plane got shot down. On September 12, 1944, his final mission was a bombing run on a synthetic oil plant in Germany. His plane, attacked by enemy aircraft, it was attacked by enemy aircraft, and two of his engines caught fire. As the plane was going down, Harold parachuted out and when he landed, he realized he couldn't walk because some shrapnel had sh uh, severed a nerve in his leg. He was picked up by some Polish farmers who turned him over to the Nazis. He was thrown onto a dung wagon along with some other prisoners, and the next day was taken to a cell in front of Germany. When he went through the town, the Germans threw rocks and called out, Luck gangsters, and he was taken into an interrogation camp for questioning. And because his name tag or dog tag had an H on it for Hebrew, he was asked, why are you here, Jew? Don't you know what we do to Jews here? And he replied, I am an American soldier fighting for my country. Finally, he was taken by train to Stalag Left One in Barth, Germany, where my dad was also a prisoner. Stalag Left One was near the town of Barth and housed approximately 9,000 British and American airmen. At this camp, Harold endured extreme cold weather and barely enough food to survive. Cabbage, often rotten, was the main food item. Eventually, the Jewish prisoners were segregated into separate barracks. <coughs> the German command, high command, and ordered all the Jewish prisoners to be killed. The Russians, however, were only a few days away, so the lives of the Jewish prisoners were spared. The Germans fled during the night of April 30th, 
which was also the same day that Hitler committed suicide. On May 1, the American flag was raised over the camp. Starlight 1 was liberated by Operation Revival between May 13 and May 15. Harold came home, he began uh, raising family, working as a special agent for the Internal Revenue Service. He was active in, in his synagogue and in the community uh, until he died at the age of 86 years. The fourth American hero I want to tell you about today is David Golden. And he was held prisoner of war the shortest length of time, but endured the worst treatment. David was living in Richmond, Virginia, uh, when he was drafted into the Army in March of 1944. He left behind a young wife and a young son, and he fought in the Battle of the Bulge, which began on December 16, 1944. The Battle of the Bulge, as many of you know, is one of the largest and bloodiest land battles ever fought by the U.S. Army. When the battle began on December 16, 1944, the Americans were outnumbered and they were caught off guard. However, by December 26, 1944, the tide started to turn and the Americans began to turn back the German offensive. When the battle was over on January 25, 1945, nearly 20,000 American soldiers had died, 47,000 wounded, and over 23,000 were captured or missing in action. <coughs> David Golden was one of those soldiers captured on January 8, 1945. The next 104 days would be the worst days of his life. He was transported in a cold, crowded boxcar to a prison camp in Bonn, or Germany. Just outside the town in the hills was a camp called Stalag 9B. It was a collection of one-story barracks surrounded by barbed wire. By mid-January 1944, the Germans began to segregate the Jewish prisoners, including David Golden, into separate barracks. The purpose of this segregation soon became apparent. Because of the relentless Allied bombing of the German fuel supplies by B-17 bombers, including crew made up of Charles Lee and Hugh Ross and Harold Leibowitz, uh, the Germans began to build underground synthetic fuel production facilities. And one of these facilities was to be at Berga, where they were going to make jet fuel. Tunnels were to be built through solid rock into the side of the mountain, and then all those tunnels were going to converge into an underground chamber. Hitler ordered thousands of concentration camp prisoners to be used for labor. But by late 1944, the concentration camp prisoners were so weak that they really couldn't do the work. So in violation of the Geneva Convention rules, a plan was made to transport 350 American POWs from Stalag 9B at Bad Orb to the Berga war camp. All Jewish prisoners at Bad Orb were slated to go. And then the Germans rounded up anyone who looked Jewish or had a Jewish sounding name, some troublemakers, and then just a few unlucky guys. The 350 American soldiers were packed into sealed boxcars and were taken by train on a five-day journey to Stalag 9B. When they arrived on February 13, 1945, they were marched up a hill to the camp, which consisted of four one-story barracks filled with triple-decked bunks. Conditions at 9B were terrible. There was not enough bunks. I mean, often slept on bare floors in unheated rooms. There was very little food, and the beds that they did have or the bunks were infested with bed bugs, lice, fleas, <coughs> and vermin. They were forced to work in the tunnels for 12-hour shifts. They had very little to eat and very little rest. They worked alongside European Jewish prisoners brought in concentration camps. They were forced to go into the mine shafts as deep as 150 feet. They labored in conditions so dusty without any protective headgear that it was often impossible to see more than a few feet ahead of them. The Germans would set off a dynamite blast, and then the men would enter the mine and use jackhammers, sledgehammers, and their hands to break up the rock, load it onto carts, and then push it out of the mines. If they slowed down, they were beaten with a shovel, kicked in the back, or shoved to the ground. And despite these horrible conditions, David managed to keep a diary on a small scrap of paper. On 
February 14th, he wrote, Valentine's Day, I'm thinking of you all at home and missing you. On February 16th, he wrote, didn't want to go back to work, but was forced to. On February 19th, his fifth day in line, he had a serious accident. And he wrote, got hit by a large rock, falling from the ceiling on top of my head, and was not that conscious. He actually had a compound skull fracture from this accident. And he was unconscious for at least four hours. <coughs> He didn't receive any medical attention. And an American had some sulfur which he applied to the wound, which probably saved his life from infection. And despite all this, he returned to work in the mines only nine days later. The American soldiers were so desperate, many were reduced to stealing food from their fellow prisoners and from those who died during the night. David never took his uniform off because he was convinced that someone would steal it. And when he got food, he ate it in small bites prolong the pleasure. And he put any bread he had in his pocket, and he never took his hand out of his pocket to keep somebody from stealing it. Many days he would awaken to find that one of his fellow prisoners had died during the night. On April 4, 1945, the Germans began to evacuate the camp as the Allies advanced on them. On April 5th, the remaining 290 Sick and starving prisoners started on a death march that would last 19 days. And during those 19 days, 50 men would die. Finally, on April the 23rd, 1945, they were liberated by the Americans. David was taken to a U.S. Army hospital in Germany. And he also later passed through Camp Lucky Strike on his way home, as did all the other prisoners. Out of the 350 men taken to Bergen, 70 died in only 69 days. This was an attrition rate of 20%, which accounted for more than 5% of all the American prisoner of war deaths in Europe. And it was the deadliest prisoner of war camp in Europe. Not much was known about Berga until about the last 20 years, because the Berga survivors were required to sign a security agreement promising not to talk about the camp. And they didn't talk about it. Somehow, David managed to keep with him a silver fountain pen he had been given in 1923 <coughs> upon the occasion of his bar mitzvah. And he used that pen to make his journal entries. The silver fountain, became, fountain pen became a symbol of all that David Golden had endured in his, and his incredible courage, strength, and determination to survive. And in 1991, 68 years after David first received the pen at his bar mitzvah, he presented it to his grandson on the eve of his bar mitzvah. And then the later the pen was used by his grandson and his wife to sign their marriage contract. After the war, David returned home to his wife and his small son. And in 1949, their second son, Arnold Golden, who is a judge in Memphis, was born. Uh, Arnold says he never heard his dad complain about anything ever. David and his wife's, David and his wife's parents were in a small grocery store in Richmond, Virginia, and he worked in that store seven days a week until he retired at the age of 65. Uh, he passed away in August of 2002 at the age of 91. Our next American hero was called up for service when he was in his mid-30s. He left a busy and promising and very comfortable law practice in Knoxville a wife and a seven-year-old son and a newborn daughter to serve his country. E. Bruce Foster was a commissioned officer in the Army and was a captain in the 106th Infantry 422nd Regiment. After training for over a year, Bruce was sent to England in late October of 1944. The 422nd Regiment was, was sent into combat on December 10, 1944 and was guarding the American line in Belgium on December 16, 1944. His unit caught the brunt of the German of the Battle of the Bulge. So after the offensive started, the Germans surrounded the 422nd and 423rd regiments and they killed, wounded, or captured nearly all of the American soldiers. And Bruce Foster was one of those soldiers captured. He was marched without food or water into Germany the bitter cold. His group were placed into crowded box cars and carried deeper into Germany. On December 23rd, 1944, the box cars were sitting in the railroad yards in Limburg 
And fortunately for Bruce and the other 1,400 soldiers in the boxcars, the cars were not marked with the required um, white crosses. The British launched an attack on guard that night. And as darkness fell, so did 61 tons of bombs. Many of the cars were hit, but Bruce's car escaped. Bruce was able to escape injury. After this near miss, they were taken to a prison camp in Bod Org, the same camp where David Golden was first taken. But Bruce being an officer, he stayed there only briefly, and he was taken about 20 miles east to off Law 13B near Himmelberg, Germany. This camp housed American and Serbian officers. The first letter he sent his wife after his capture was dated January 6, 1945, from Hamilburg, Germany. He said that Christmas and New Year's had been bleak, and that he hoped that she had enjoyed it more. But his family's Christmas had also been bleak, because at that time they only knew he was missing in action and did not know if he was even alive. The Hamilburg camp had one prisoner that caused the camp to receive special attention from the U.S. Army. General Patton's son-in-law, Lieutenant Colonel John Waters, had been taken prisoner of war, and he was held at that camp. So in March of 1945, Patton sent the 4th Armored Division to liberate the camp. It was a daring but poorly planned maneuver. And Patton denied having ordered the assault to free his son-in-law. The soldiers in the camp heard the first words of the officer in charge of the task force say, where is Colonel Waters? <laughs> Waters was shot by a German guard and was taken to a camp hospital uh, during the building uh, of the camp. The special unit was able to open the gate, but once it did, it had no way to transport all the prisoners. Waters was in the hospital anyway. The tanks took some of the prisoners, but not Waters. Uh, on the way back, the task force was ambushed and forced to surrender. The prisoners remaining at the camp were given the choice of either staying or taking off into the German countryside and trying to find their way to the American lines. Bruce joined several other guys and they started off. Their freedom, however, was short-lived. A few nights later, they were walking on the road and saw some German soldiers following them. And one of the American soldiers spoke some German, so he tried to pretend he was German, uh, but the soldiers were not fooled. Uh, once again, Bruce and his comrades became prisoners of war. Uh, this time, the German guards were not as nice to them when they got back to camp. The remaining time in the camp was grim. It was very cold. There was little food and nothing to do. After being a prisoner of war for five months, Bruce was liberated in May of 1945. And he was also taken through Camp Lucky Strike and then came home. He arrived by train at the Ellen and Depot near downtown Knoxville in early June. His nine-year-old son, who was Foster Jr., did not recognize him at first. He had lost nearly 50 pounds and only weighed about 90 pounds. He was sent to a hospital in Coral Gables, Florida for about three months for treatment for frostbite and other injuries. In the fall of 1945, he returned to his law practice in Knoxville, where he served his clients for the next 43 years until his death in 1988. He served as president of the Knoxville Bar Association, as did his son, Eve Bruce Foster, Jr., who also followed his father in the practice of law. Once liberated, <coughs> these American heroes returned home, very different, yet very much the same. They all had physical problems caused by the war which stayed with them the rest of their lives. They all had emotional and mental scarring that never left them. And while in prison camp, they were all cold, hungry, and homesick. And in the dark, lonely hours of the night, they all wondered if they would ever get home to see their families again. But they all returned, raised families, and were hardworking, productive members of their communities. So what were their common bonds which helped them survive and endure their prison experience? Well, they never gave up and they never gave in. They were determined to be reunited with their families. They had an enormous love for their country and for their families. During the war, they had all seen so much death and violence that after that experience, each day was a gift. Each day was a great day. And each day had to be lived to the fullest. They were forgiving. 
that did not harbor grudges or resentment, that were optimistic, that were grateful just to be alive. They didn't complain, they didn't whine, they did not waste food, they did not eat cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> they instilled in their children respect for their country and a desire to serve. And at an early age, these men had seen the very worst. They were true American heroes. My dad died on February 27, 2009. And two days before he died, I called him on the cell phone on my way to work, as I did every day, to see how he was doing. And I knew at this point he was terminally ill, that he couldn't take care of himself, that he couldn't walk, that he was in a lot of pain. And he had been for some months. And I said, well, Dad, how are you doing today? And he answered in a very weak voice, I've never been better. And I thought, what an amazing gift. What an amazing way to do life. So there is a great lesson in all these, these stories for all of us. As we face adversity on a much, much lesser scale, we do need to remember that each day is a gift. And we need to face each day with optimism and hope and a determination to succeed. And I am very grateful to have the opportunity to share these stories with you. We must never forget the sacrifices that all of our veterans have made for our freedom and our liberty. And I want to thank the Ross, Leibowitz, Golden, and Foster families for sharing their stories with me so I can share them with you. And some of the family members are here with us today, and I want to recognize them at this time. Uh, I'll start with the family of Hugh Ross. His son, Judge Carol Ross. You're not standing. I don't know who you are. Judge Carol Ross of the 10th Judicial District. Kathy. You saw their pictures in the truck earlier. They look a little different now. <laughs> Linda Ross and her husband, Paul Baxter. Uh, Hugh's brother, Charles Ross, and wife, Edna. And his sister, Jen Reed. And in the back, okay. And Hugh's aunt, Jewel Mitchell. And I stand up to, I, I questioned her on that because I don't see how she can be his aunt, but she says she is, and she would not give me her age. <laughs> his nieces and um, nieces Ann Reed, Krista Davis, no, I'm sorry, Ann Reed and, and Deborah Dyke, and grand nieces Krista Davis and Allison Dyke. Did I do it right? <laughs> okay. Thank you all for being here. She had a trial. Had a trial, <laughs> yeah. And those things get in the way of And then, of course, my family, my mother, Judy Lee, and up my sister, Char Reverend Charles Sherwood Hawk. We're into wearing black robes in our family. Reverend Charles Hawk and her husband, Colonel Lee Sherwood Hawk. <laughs> Two of my dad's younger brothers, Ernest Lee and J.D. Lee, they were not He's from Madisonville, where all great people come from. And his name's Bill Robinson. Bill, stand up. You have a whole program just on Bill. And are there any other POWs here or anybody from the Smoky Mountain chapter? Well, thank all of you for being here. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. 